that the, the great embarrassment for evolutionary theory, which can explain the tongue of the hummingbird, the structure of the orchid, the mating habits of the groundhog, and the migration of the monarch butterfly, nevertheless, the great embarrassment to evolutionary theory is the human uh, neocortex. Lumholtz, who was a pretty straight evolutionary biologist, described the evolution of the human neocortex as the most dramatic transformation of a major organ of a higher animal in the entire fossil record. Well, why is this an embarrassment? Well, because it's the organ that thought up the theory of evolution. So, you know, can you say tautology? That's the problem right there. So, it is necessary in evolutionary theory to account for the dramatic emergence of the human neocortex in this very narrow window of time. Basically, in about two million years, these higher, they went from being higher primates, hominids, to being true humans, as truly human as you and I tonight. What the hell happened? What was the factor? The Earth was already old. Many hundreds of higher animal forms had come and gone. And the fire of intelligence had never been kindled. So what happened? I think that the answer lies in, in diet, generally, and in psychedelic chemistry in particular. I think that as the African continent grew drier, we were forced out of the ecological niche we had evolved into, which was we were canopy-dwelling primates, insectivores, complex signaling repertoire, uh, evolutionary dead end. But when we came under nutritional pressure, we were flexible enough, and this is the key to humanness at every stage of its development, our maddening flexibility. Other animal and plant species can't react. We can our flexibility, we began to experiment with a new kind of diet and to leave the trees and explore the new environment of the grassland. And evolving concomitantly in the grassland were various forms of ungulate animals, double-stomached animals whose manure is the ideal medium for mushrooms, coprophytic mushrooms, dung-loving mushrooms, many of whom produce psilocybin. Well, I myself in Kenya have seen baboons spreading out over a grassland and notice that their behavior is they flick over old cow pies. Why? Because there are beetle grubs there. So they already had a behavioral vector for nutrition, for protein, that would lead them to investigate the cow pies. Well, in the Amazon, after a few couple of days of fog and rain, these psilocybin mushrooms, Stropheric cubensis, can be the size of dinner plates. I mean, in other words, you can't miss it if you're, if you're a foraging primate, you can't miss it. And the taste is pleasant. And psilocybin has unique characteristics, both as uh, hallucinogen and other properties that make it the obvious chemical trigger for higher processes, and I'll run through this quickly for you, but here it is. In very low doses, doses where you don't, you wouldn't say you were stoned or loaded or anything like that, but just in doses you might obtain by nibbling as you foraged, uh, it increases visual acuity. In other words, it's like a technological improvement on your vision chemical binoculars lying there in the grass. Well, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out if an animal is a carnivorous forager and there's a food which improves its vision, those that avail themselves of that food will have greater success in obtaining food and rearing their children to sexual maturity, which is the name of the game in evolution. So step one, small doses of psilocybin increase visual acuity and food giving. Uh, success. Step two, slightly larger doses of psilocybin in primates create what's called arousal. 
this is what you have after a double cappuccino. In highly sexed animals like primates, you get male erection. So what do you have here? You have a factor which increases what anthropologists, without a trace of humor, refer to as increases in increased instances of successful copulation. Uh, in other words, the animals eating the psilocybin are more sexually active, therefore more pregnancies are occurring, therefore more, more infants are being born, therefore there is a process which would tend to automatically outbreed the non-psilocybin using members of the population. Step two toward higher consciousness. Step three, you eat still more mushrooms. Now you're not foraging with shark. <laughs> Nor are you horsing around with your uh, opposed gender acquaintances. Uh, instead, you're nailed to the ground in hallucinogenic ecstasy. And one of the amazing things about psilocybin above, say, five or six grams of uh, dried material is it causes glossolalia, spontaneous bursts of language-like behavior under the obvious control of internal syntax. And I believe syntax existed before spoken language, that syntax controls spatial behaviors and body languages and is not necessarily restricted to the production of vocal speech. So there it is in a nutshell. We ate our way to higher consciousness. The mushroom made us better hunters, better survivors. It, among those in the population who used it, their sexual drive was increased, hence they outbred the more reluctant members of the tribe to get loaded. And finally, it created a, a kind of neuroleptic seizure which led to these downloading of these syntactically controlled vocalizations which became the raw material uh, for the evolution of, of language. And it's amazing to me the, the straight people, the academics, believe language is no more than 35,000 years old. That means it's as, as basic to human beings as the bicycle pump. Uh, it's just something somebody invented 35,000 years ago. It's got nothing to do with primate evolution and, you know, the long march of hominidity and all that malarkey. No, it's just a, an ability, a use to which syntax can be put that it previously had not been put. I think before language, spoken language, things were very touchy-feely, and the wink and the nod carried you a great distance, and, and uh, gestural communication was very high. That's why, and I should I say this and then end, to me it begins and ends with these psychedelic substances. The synergy of the psilocybin in the hominid diet brought us out of the animal mind and into the world of articulated speech and, and imagination. And technology developed and developed and uh, mushrooms were, you know, invade against, faded. There was migrations, cultural change. But now, having split the atom, having sequenced our genome, having taken the temperature of betel juice and all the rest of it, we're now back where we started. And like the shaman who makes the journey into the well of darkness and returns with the pearl of immortality, you don't dwell in the well of darkness, which was human history. You capture the essence of the thing, which is the godlike power of the shaman smith, the technologist, the, the demon artificer, the worker of metals, the conjurer of spirits and you carry that power back out of history, and it's in that dimension, outside of history, that you create a true humanness and true community. And that's the adventure that we are in the act of undertaking. Thank you very much.